She recounts, he was the one who brought Nehru's great books to Americans, edited at Nehru's request by Richard Walsh, who wrote the introduction to his book. Richard Walsh was the one who discerned in the young Sukaru of Indonesia the promise of a future Asian leader and encouraged him to write his first book and so became known to the West. Lin Yutang, one of the most influential Chinese writers of his generation, translator, linguist, and inventor of the typewriter for the Japanese, was a close friend of Richard Walsh who published many of his works. According to the Walsh family newspaper, Richard Walsh's influence spread to Indonesia when he agreed to publish Indonesian Reflections by Sutan Sojir, written while he was jailed and exiled by the Dutch. Former premier of Indone the Indonesian Republic, he successfully presented the case of his people against the Dutch before the United Nations. Richard Walsh negotiated with FDR. He encouraged Margaret Sanger, and he sought the counsel of Dorothy Canfield Fisher. As a reward for his dedication to promoting diverse thought, Spalding, one of the leading librarians in the country, once declared, for years I have found that the John Day Company catalog is almost the only one issued by any publisher from which I find that I have to buy practically every book for the library. <laughs> Always a man of strong moral convictions, he became more and more politically active, using his position in the world to make a difference. His causes were many and his dedication unwavering. In the late 1930s, World concerns turned to the emerging Nazis' influence on the Middle East. Understanding the vital role of his pub that his publications could have on stemming the tide through public awareness, Richard Walsh addressed Hitler's invasion of the Arab nations in his Asia magazine with articles such as Hitler Comes to the Arabs by Afton Vitton. In 1935, <coughs> Richard Walsh Added political refugee, aided political refugees from Nazism. A decade later, he raised funds for the victims of Hiroshima. In 1937, the Walshes established the Chinese Emergency Relief Committee to support Chinese residents, res support Chinese resistance against the Japanese aggression, which became the United China Relief. Board members included Richard Walsh, Henry Luce, Wendell Wilkie, John D. Rockefeller III, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., and Honorary Chair Eleanor Roosevelt. It was the largest philanthropic effort to aid the Chinese people up to that time, raising over $50 million in donations. Pearl Buck com commented, his natural ease made him an excellent chairman of an am amazing variety of organizations. How often I watched him see seemingly effortlessly. Al he allowed every d dissonant voice to speak, every argument to be heard, and then quietly and in a few words gathered the consensus of opinion into a lucid resolution. He had the rare gift of creating order out of disorder, an editorial gift. But beyond then, that, he had the gift of human understanding, which enabled him to select the essence from the non-essential non and find points of agreement among those who disagreed. This is but a partial list of the causes to which he dedicated his leadership and his expertise, from the Committee of Equality in Naturalization to the International League for the Rights of Man. He formed the East and West Association during World War II to aid the, ally war, the Allied War in the effort in Asia by helping Americans understand the culture and the concerns of the people of China and India. As part of the East and West Association outreach, the Walsh's sponsored radio shows with Lin Yutung's daughters telling Chinese children about the American children's role in the war effort. With nearly 200 listed members, the chairman of the National Committee to Repeal the Chinese Exclusion Act, Richard Walsh, 
reached out to those of influence in an effort to reverse the harsh, the harsh immigration laws aimed at the Chinese. His heroic efforts had, a, had led to a successful campaign for its repeal by the United States Congress in 1943, an effort that defied all odds and, he hoped, would begin to turn the tide of immigration tolerance in the United States. As chairman, he organized and led the first India Famine Relief Committee during the Bengal Famine of 1943 to 1944. In 1943, Dr. Y.C. James Yun was invited to visit the Walshes at Green Hills Farm. From their discussions emerged the need for education and social reform in the Chinese countryside. Ways that Americans could help and the creation of an American Chinese Committee for Mass Education Movement with Richard Walsh agreeing to take the role as president. Walsh managed to continue writing even in these days of intense world involvement. In 1948, the, the edition of the Walsh, fam, fam, Walsh Family Newsletter, the children write, the book which Daddy worked on ever since 1945, The Adventures of Marco Polo, will be published this autumn. It's a new edition of the book that has been famous for several hundred years and this edition is supposed to be made more interesting for modern readers. It w has many beautiful illustrations by Cyrus Leroy Baldridge. The other book the children went on to report is Beginning an American by William O. Douglas. It consists of many speeches which Mr. Douglas had made since he became an Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court in 1939. Some of the speeches are famous because they have said things that no other men in high position have dared or known how to say. His reach spanned the globe as honorary president of the Korean American Cultural Association, board member of the American League for Puerto Rican Independence, and chair of the executive committee of the India League of America. This photo captures him in his capacity as chairman of the India League at the reception for Nehru at the Waldorf Astoria in New York on October 15th of 1945, along with Mrs. Indira Gandhi. In 1949, the Walshes fun, uh, founded an adoption agency called Welcome House after being unable to locate an agency that was willing to place a 15-month-old child of mixed racial background because of his brown skin. The Yoders would become the first Welcome House family, adopting t 10, of of many, uh, of 10 children of many races, living down the lane and frequently visited by Richard Walsh, who became their granddaddy. Dale Yoder, birth son of the first Welcome House family and professor at Albright College, recalls, Granddaddy Walsh was a wonderful person in so many ways, as a voice in the original plans for Welcome House and then as a frequent visitor to our Welcome House home. His contributions to the success of this non-traditional family were, co were considerable. Dale Yoder continues, as the kindly grandfather, Mr. Walsh was particularly fond of telling stories from the past. He had traveled widely and brought many tales of those travels to frequently awestruck Welcome House children. Travels to China certainly were well received. He also shared the wonders of Africa, animals in the wild, the geographic differences, the cultural ways, all excitingly told and excitingly received. Note the wheelchair in the background. His strokes did not deter him from his beloved visits to those children. Richard Walsh had a common touch, uh, Dr. Yoder recalls. Though he and his wife walked with kings and presidents, they never flashed an air of superiority. Kind, gentle, and caring are the adjectives I find appropriate to describe Mr. Walsh. Though his wife was better known, Richard Walsh was certainly the special person.
The Walshes adopted five-year-old Henriette in 1951, whose biological father was African-American and mother was German. Richard Walsh published The Maple Sugar Book, hailed in 1950 as the best treatise ever written on the maple industry, and was the only compendium, compendium of sugar lore, science, and practice available at the time. Walsh's fascination with this content hooked his family on establishing a, 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 a cabin in Vermont as their own retreat. Then, on a family trip to the West in the summer of 1953, the unthinkable happened. Richard Walsh experienced the first of seven years of strokes. In 1955, Chieko was adopted by the Walshes. Her biological mother was Japanese and her father was African American. She was the last of six children officially adopted by Richard Walsh and Jean Walsh. Many other children joined the family as foster children. After several years of strokes, which left him blind and totally dis disabled, Richard Walsh died at the age of 74 on his beloved Green Hills farm in May, of 20, May the 28th of 1960 and is buried in his family cemetery in, in New York. In our many months of research, we have come to truly respect and love this man. Pearl S. Buck became who she became, created what she created, and accomplished what she accomplished because Richard Walsh possessed the intellect and the skill to move the mountains that made her dreams a reality. His strong convictions, his innate belief in the dignity of humankind, and his love of children shaped immigration in the United States, gave platforms for those who had no forum to express their beliefs, even when they differed from his own. He gave life to children who never had a chance and fostered in others a greatness they never knew they possessed. The world has been blessed beyond measure by the life and the passions of Richard J. Walsh. Thank you. What wonderful presentations, weren't they? Let's have another round of applause while she's in. And we now have a few minutes that so we can open the floor up for questions if anybody has any. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question for the first presenter. Could you say more about uh, Lossing's attitude towards, um, you might say, indigenous farming practices? Did they change after he spent decades Yes, they did. There? Yes, they did. And he dealt with it in such a wonderful way, accepting they had value, traditional farming practices in China had value, but his goal was to enhance the eventual uh, product from the land. And he was welcomed because the whole dynamic in China had changed. And it was a measure of advancement if people would accept the, the Western technology, not replacing, enhancing. What happened in the first Mrs. Walsh? <laughs> the, oh, yeah. it, when it said at the end, Jean and, and Richard Walsh? Um, yes, we made an assumption there. Um, G, uh, Pearl Buck was actually, actually used the name Jean Walsh. You'll see it on her driver's license and, and all that sort of thing when she came to the United States. And the reason for that has to do with the translation of her name. Uh, pearl, when translated in, in Chinese, the, uh, is precious gem, and, the, and precious is Jean. And so she was called Jean. And when she came to the United States, that became J-E-A-N. And uh, so she was Jean Walsh when she married Richard Walsh. But wasn't he married previously? Oh, who the, oh, is the Ruby? Ruby Walsh. Ah. <laughs> she never remarried? Uh, he always kept in contact with her. Uh, we have a magnificent letter that he wrote to his children uh, where he said, uh, I want you to work with me to make sure that uh, everything is as it should be for your mother. And uh, he, he had very strong feelings about, about making that happen. 
So she lived still in in um, this in the same place. She didn't, didn't move around. Uh, and tell them about the she went to uh, Las Vegas. Las Vegas with her. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's important. Yeah. yeah, she actually went with uh, with uh, Pearl and with with uh, Richard Walsh to to Las Vegas for them to get married. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, did you find uh, any link between Richard Walsh's smoking a pipe and his uh, illnesses? And his illnesses? Yeah. Um, there's nothing that I've read that, no. that actually says that, but I think a lot of some of that can be surmised. We know now that, that smoking, and by the way, uh, those of you who have ever seen photographs of him, the photographs are always with a pipe in his mouth. <laughs> we have Super 8 movies of him wheeling wheelbarrows around uh, Green Hills Farm with kids spewing out the sides and the pipe in his mouth. <laughs> so it was a, a very much a constant thing. Uh, Pearl Buck also died of cancer, and there is always the speculation that part of that could be secondary as well, even though she was a, a, a social smoker too. So. You know, there's all there's always the possibility of that link. And come visit us at Green Hills Farm. His <laughs> pipe is actually sitting on his desk. Yes. Uh, this is uh, maybe addressed to both of you. Pearl uh, Buck used the pseudonym uh, she, uh, John Sedges, mm -hmm. and uh, I had two I have two questions about that. One was, did this cause some friction? It was always my understanding that, you know, she felt, well, she could always write a best-selling novel as Pearl Bach, but she uh, couldn't under any other name, so she picked John Sedges and wrote, you know, four books. And um, I was wondering if there was some conflict, like, between Richard Walsh and her over wanting to change your name. The other is that in John Sedges's book, The Townsman, which is about a young man going to Kansas and uh, establishing a town out of nothing, essentially building uh, mud bricks. And I mean, she describes to the nth degree how these mud brick houses were, you know, constructed. Whether that was picked up, you know, when she went uh, in the rural areas, as you said, with John Ross and Buck. I think it coincided, went. but I don't think it was the inspiration. The inspiration <laughs> was because Richard Walsh was born in Kansas. Sedges is derived from the name of the grass in Kansas. It wasn't just an abstract out of the, it was, there was a reason for it. There was a reason for it. And the reason that she, the inspiration for writing as a male was because there were so many males of the day, Theodore Dreiser for one, who was very resentful yeah. that this woman who did not write about the eternal human condition, very derisive to the entire Asian community, but, when she heard this, obviously the off uh, set of that would be eventually she would write as a male. And it's amazing how well it was received because she was a male. I think I read somewhere that Janice was a physical therapist. And she was just died a a couple occupational of years. therapist. Yeah, she just mm -hmm. died a couple of years ago. No, two months ago. Two mm -hmm. months ago. Yes. So, <laughs> I read it recently. Mm -hmm. but, did any of the children write or go into the publishing business? The children, to our knowledge, weren't. But the siblings, the Seiden Stricker siblings, were all writers. Um, and of course, you were introduced to Edgar, her brother. Mm -hmm. Edgar wrote extensively. And all of it focused on health issues. And grace. And so Grace wrote many books. As a matter of fact, a book about her sister. Of the seven children, three of them survived. And those three were all writers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, they were writers. They were all, all writers. Three of them. 
what, what about her children, the, uh, the, the Welsh children? Are they alive? Other than, than Janice, are they still alive? No, they are not all alive. Carol died at the age of 72 at the Vineland Training School. Recently, as we mentioned, Janice passed away two months ago. Uh, Chaco died in, in 2014, as well as John in 2014. All the other children are still alive. Um, uh, Susie, you mentioned uh, that uh, John Lossing Buck had worked with a uh, Chinese agency during the, uh, the Sino-Japanese War. Um, he had such a large volume of research on, on Chinese agriculture. Is that the only time that the government tapped into his expertise, or was he a regular in the, the regular. halls of power mm -hmm. in He China? was recognized as yeah. an authority. And you would think because, and, and Pearl sometimes shared the concept, um, almost the arrogance of the centuries and centuries and centuries of Chinese agriculture, that tradition, and that he would enter with the introduction of Western technology. But because, as I, as, as I mentioned, because of the nature of the movement at that time, it was embraced. It was embraced. And you, the extent is mind blowing. Um, in 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 the, if only you could access the actual books, they were magnificent. I don't know when I've been more excited about a book. Um, and there were many people. Now the only people who could do research were the people who had actually taken his courses, and they're 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 illustrated. You that you actually could you could have seen it, but it was such small print. In fact, it was an obligation of it course, if they were going exactly. to be his students. Also, um, I just could comment too that his work is still recognized. It is still today. recognized. And they had a symposium about John Lawson Buck in 2013 at Nanjing University. Yeah. As well as 2008 in Zhenjiang. And as a matter of fact, and this is something I really do have to take a moment to do, to thank, to, to say how grateful I was to get to know Paul Lawson Buck. He is a very gracious man and very happy to have people understand what his father was about. Uh, and he was extremely helpful in providing uh, much information from his father's letters, the pictures that he shared. So it, it was really, it was my pleasure. That's great. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, once again, we want to thank our presenters so much for a wonderful job.